What is up everybody? This is Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem, but focus on the solution. And if you're new to my channel, my channel is all about mental health. So if you're someone like me, actively trying to improve your mental and emotional well-being, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. And boy, do I have a treat for you today. All right, some of you know, some of you don't know, I have a podcast, and lately I've been interviewing a lot of really cool people, and I just had the honor and the pleasure of interviewing Lori Gottlieb, all right? She is the author of the best-selling book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, all right? This has been a bestseller since last year. It's still selling like crazy. She um, has this book being adapted into a TV show that's being produced by Eva Longoria. She just started a podcast, all sorts of stuff. But anyways, I interviewed her. She's gonna talk a little bit about that, but in this uh, interview, we talk a lot about the therapeutic process, who needs therapy, when's the right time to stop therapy, medications, all sorts of stuff. All right, so this podcast will be out this Wednesday, but I wanted to put it up on the YouTube channel because I know it'll help a lot of people out there. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Lori Gottlieb. Hello, Lori, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing well, how are you doing? I am fantastic, it is an amazing day. Um, but yeah, for, for my audience, I've, I've given you an amazing intro, but for my audience uh, who isn't familiar with your work, can you, Tell them a little bit about who you are in this amazing book that you wrote. Maybe you should talk to someone. What's that about? Right. So, yeah, I am a psychotherapist and I write the weekly Dear Therapist column for The Atlantic. Um, I am uh, launching right now a new podcast produced by Katie Couric for iHeartRadio called Dear Therapists with another therapist, Guy Winch. Um, we both did our TED Talks and met through the TED world. And uh, we're very excited to bring that to everybody. And I wrote a book called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. And the book brings people into my therapy room to help them see what I have the privilege of seeing, but most people don't, which is the human condition and all of its beauty, all of its struggle, but also all of its joy, all mm. of the heroic moments. Um, all the ways that we grow and transform and how hard it is to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I follow four main patients in the book, but then there's a fifth patient and the fifth patient is me mm -hmm. as I go through my own therapy with my therapist. Yeah. Oh my God. And I, I binged your book. I usually read books that are a little bit more like kind of educational research and stuff, but you're an amazing storyteller. And I, I was just, I was hooked. And so let me ask you this. I, I assume that you, you know, you have a ton of clients and everything. How did you decide which stories you were going to follow um, in your book? I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read, but I, I think you did a great job covering a range of topics, especially kind of guiding someone through the end of life type deal. You had somebody who was struggling with cancer. Um, but yeah, how did you did you purposely kind of get a few different topics and people to cover in your book? Yeah, I mean, I think that there were so many when you talked about story a minute ago, I think what I do all day is I listen to stories. Mm -hmm. And like I said in my TED talk, I feel like even though my job title is therapist, I feel like my job title should be editor because <laughs> everybody comes in with a story and we're all unreliable narrators of our mm -hmm. lives. We tell stories in a particular way. We leave things out. We minimize certain things. We emphasize other things. And often those faulty narratives keep us stuck. We think they protect us. We think we're putting forth the version of the story that serves us. But actually, if we can't fill out the story, if we can't see other perspectives, if we can't understand that maybe we're being the victim and not the protagonist in our story, you know, a lot of our stories are about being trapped mm -hmm. um, by people, by circumstances. If we can't find the agency in our stories, we can't move forward. We can't make changes. We can't um, change our role. So in terms of the stories that I chose for the book, um, there were so many because I'm fascinated <laughs> by all of the stories. And, and, you know, of course I was, before I was a therapist, I worked in film and television. Mm -hmm. I, then I went to medical school, then I became a journalist. So I, I've approached story from a lot of different angles. And I think that 
when I thought about what stories I wanted to include in the book, I wanted the people to seem very different from one another on the surface. Mm. So different ages, different genders, different um, stages of development psychologically, um, different kinds of problems. So you, you mentioned the, the young newlywed who came back from her honeymoon and was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And then you also have um, you know, a, a woman in her 20s who keeps hooking up with the wrong guys, including <laughs> someone from the waiting room. I don't mean yeah. in the waiting room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, <fun> our <laughs> office is definitely not that exciting. But, um, but she meets him in the waiting room. And, you know, she, so there are a lot of sort of, I think, comedic moments, um, mm. because as human beings, we're all ridiculous. And I think we're so, we take ourselves so seriously, but we need to be able to laugh at ourselves and laugh at the human condition Absolutely. as well. So um, everybody seems very different. And I say all five of us, because I include myself as mm -hmm. one of the patients. And yet we are so similar underneath it all. So when people start reading the book, the feedback that I've gotten has been that they thought they had nothing in common with maybe this patient or that patient. And they realized they have something in common with every single patient. Mm, absolutely. That's, that's something that, um, that I, I really had to come to terms with because when on my own sobriety journey, like the first time I went to like 12 step meetings and stuff, I was like, I, I can't relate to any of these people. Like I haven't lost my wife or house or anything like that. Right. And, when you start to really listen to other people's stories, it's not even so much for me, it's not even so much about those specific experiences, right? But it's, right, it's not, it's, it's not those, about, yeah. yeah, it's, it's not that you have had the same experiences. It's that underneath it all, the, the same questions, feelings, um, mm -hmm. you know, these, these ideas that we all have about, you know, what does it mean to love and be loved and how do I deal with, mistakes that I've made or how do I deal with regret or why, you know, what are my blind spots? Because we all have them. And when you can see somebody else um, unable to look at their own blind spots, mm -hmm. right. Or to be trapped in, in these patterns where they keep ending up in the same place over and over and over kind of like, you know, if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, it might be you. We don't <laughs> right. think that about ourselves. We can see it in other people. Um, but I think that we see ourselves most clearly through the lens of other people's stories, because it's one thing if someone says to you, hey, you're like this, or you do this, or this is keeping you stuck. And our, our instinct is to say, no, I'm not. No, I don't. <laughs> That's not me. But if you read about somebody else, you start to say, oh, I'm kind of a little like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of going back to uh, something that you said, you know, just about like, if, if you go to every, every bar you go to and a fight breaks out, maybe it's you. Um, something that I absolutely love, and we're on the same page with this, is this is something that helped me on my own, you know, recovery and mental health journey is that, that personal responsibility. And you talk about that quite a bit, like, uh, I think it was like in the first chapter, yeah. where, you know, we have to start looking at ourselves and because, you know, I, I've worked with many, many drug addicts and alcoholics and other people with mental health issues. And we have this instant, it's a, almost like our ego's way of protecting ourselves. Like, oh, well, my mom did this, my dad did this, my husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or friends or, you know, my boss did this. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of just, you know, that introspection and saying like, what, what is my part in this? How does that play a role in the therapeutic process? Yeah. So when most people come to therapy, what they'll say in however, whatever words they choose is, I want something to change. I'm not happy with the way things are. I want something to change. But then when you dig a little deeper, what you find out is what they want to change is someone else or something else. <laughs> they want someone else or something else to change. They, they're not necessarily saying, I want to change. I want the things around me to change. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I, you know, one thing that I remember when I was, um, when I was an intern, one of my supervisors said, before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes. Uh, right. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm not disputing the fact that there are definitely difficult people out there and there are difficult circumstances for sure. But at the same time, how do we respond to those people or circumstances? Mm -hmm. What choices do we have? And so I think once we start looking at our choices, we start to say, oh, I can change what I do. I might not be able to change what somebody else does, but mm -hmm. I can change what I do. And when I change what I do, I can influence what they do. Because if you start doing something different, 
they're going to have to do something different too because they're getting mm -hmm. a different stimulus, right? Than, yeah. than your normal dance that you do. People are often engaged in this dance where like one person says this, the other person says this, they do this, they have mm -hmm. the same fight, the same argument over and over and over. And I think when you mentioned people and their parents, um, you know, I think what happens is that people uh, are almost trying to get their parents to do something different now, even when they're adults, um, to make up for what they didn't get as a child. Mm. And that doesn't lead you anywhere. It's, it's like, so a lot of people are kind of like the argument that they have in their head is, I won't change until you, mom or dad, right. treat me differently uh, you know, from when I was eight. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like, you know, we don't realize that as adults, we are free, but yeah. we don't accept our freedom because mm -hmm. with freedom comes responsibility, going back to responsibility. And so if we choose to be free, we realize, oh, I'm responsible for my life now. And I can't blame mom or dad or my partner or my boss or anyone else. I get to choose and I'm responsible for choosing. Absolutely, and and I can I can speak to that from from personal experience. Like I am very fortunate. I was fortunate enough to have a sponsor when I first got sober, and he just beat it into my head, just drilled it right in. Where he said, "Chris, it's a lot easier for you to change you than it is to change the rest of the world." Yeah. And I and I hated that because I wanted to wait for other people to change. Like, don't you see how you are affecting me? Don't you see I'm reacting? You know because you're treating me this way. And today I've been sober seven and a half years and my son's mom and I, we have the most amazing, beautiful relationship. She's remarried, has another son. I have, you know, my beautiful girlfriend, but we co-parent just in this incredible way. And I try to teach people like, the, the only reason for that is because of all the text messages I never sent her. Right, all yep. those angry ones. I wrote them out, and and I would actually like send them to like a friend. I'd be like, "Hey, do you think I'm justified in saying this?" And I really try to argue my point, but um, because I knew, like, I knew intellectually, like, it wasn't going to go anywhere by by reacting in that way. But just like you said too, when I started to change, the people around me started to change, right? Because we don't, we feel justified in in fueling that fire in retaliating and in fighting back and everything like that but we don't understand how it's just making things worse so right well often yeah. often we want to be we want the other person to see and hear and understand our perspective and we feel so unseen and unheard by them but the way that we're trying to get seen and heard is counterproductive mm. it's kind of like if you're yelling at someone or if you're accusing them of something they can't hear you they can't see you they feel attacked, but if you can imagine their perspective, and that's you know what the book is all about. Um, if you can imagine their perspective, it doesn't mean you agree with their perspective, by the way, right. and it doesn't mean that they aren't mistreating you. So you know you've got to be able to hold those ideas at the same time that I don't like the way they're treating me, and maybe I'm doing something that exacerbates the situation. Maybe mm. I'm doing something that that impacts them in a way where they treat me this way. And so how can I act in a way that aligns with my own values, that aligns with my own way of, of kindness, of generosity, even if um, you don't necessarily agree with the other person, usually the other person, they're not going to have like a personality transplant. They're still going to be yeah, them. Exactly. Um, but usually the conflict will deescalate. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And something I, I wanted to ask you about too, because I think it's so huge and a lot of, I don't think a lot of people understand this about therapy, but you, you talk about like, especially, you know, through your own personal experience with your therapist, you talk about having that kind of clear end in sight, right? And you discuss yeah. like, you know, helping patients like, you know, become their own therapist and come up with their own solutions and not just spoon feeding them answers and everything like that. And yeah, I just, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that therapy is not meant to always be like this forever deal. So how do you set that up with like a new client? Do you have like a goal and like, hey, here's where, here's where we want to reach and this is where we're going to be done. Or do you have any suggestions for somebody to know when they're at a place where maybe they don't need therapy anymore and they're kind of on their own now? Yeah, I always like to say that when somebody comes in, I'm listening for the music under the lyrics. So the lyrics are the problem that they're coming in with. Here's what's going on with 
some family member. Here's what's going on with my work situation, or I'm anxious, or I'm depressed, or um, I'm eating too much, or drinking too much, or whatever it is. Um, and I'm listening for the music under those lyrics, which is what is the underlying struggle or pattern that got you to this place in the first place? Mm -hmm. And when we can understand that, that's really what the goal of therapy is, because whatever they're dealing with, that underlying struggle is going to show up in lots of different ways in their life. So um, I think we really work on that goal. And I am, will be the first to say, you know, if somebody's coming in and we've worked through a lot and they're sort of chit-chatting, either they're not telling me something that we should be talking about or they're done. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and we need to figure out which one it is. So I, you know, it's kind of like raising your children where you want them to grow up to be independent, to be able mm. to function as competent adults. And the same thing with your patients. You don't want them to rely on you forever. You want to give them the tools and the skills and the self-knowledge and the courage and th that they need to make the changes that they need to make so that they can navigate through the vicissitudes of life pretty well on their own. And I don't mean perfectly because none of, none of us can do that perfectly, mm. but, but that they're managing much better than they were. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's this myth about therapy that you're going to come in, you're going to talk about your childhood ad nauseum and you're never <laughs> going to leave. Right. Yeah. Um, and it just, that is not, therapy is a very active process. It's not about downloading the problem of the week. It's not about quote unquote complaining about something every week. It's about having a mirror held up to you so you can see yourself in a way that maybe you haven't been willing or able to do. Mm. And that mirror is going to help you um, so that you won't need the therapist to be holding up the mirror. You'll be able to hold it up to yourself when you've gone through this process. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, my, my therapist, you know, she's, she's great at, you know, recognizing, you know, my patterns. And like you're talking about, like, you know, that underlying, like uh, uh, those things that are going on. And no matter what the situation is, you kind of see those same themes repeating themselves. And then, you know, eventually you start catching them on your own. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I this is, you know, here are the signs that this is happening again. Mm -hmm. And, and um, something that you talked about too, is is medications right so yeah we got antidepressants anti-anxiety medications some of the most popular ones and something that you know i think about a lot um especially as a recovering pill addict is a lot of us turn to these medications almost like they're these silver bullet and they're these very quick fixes and can you can you kind of expand on that a little bit about you know medications versus therapy or in combination um like how do you talk to your your clients about, you know, being on antidepressants or being on anti-anxiety medications? Do they have this expectation that those should be their, their end all be all for the fix? Yeah. I mean, I think that the people who come to therapy are interested in doing the work. Um, but there are some times when I will see someone in therapy and I feel like they could benefit from medication and I will send them for a, um, a, a, con a consultation with a psychiatrist. So then mm -hmm. I work with psychiatrists all the time. Um, I share patients with psychiatrists. Um, they're doing the medication management. I'm doing the therapy and it works really well. It just depends on the situation. I think that there are people who co go to psychiatrists and the psychiatrist will call me and say, this person doesn't really need medication, but they need therapy uh -huh. and they refer them to me. Um, because I think that some people think that I won't have to deal with the the pain if i take a pill i would mm. have to go into those places and what people don't realize is that you know sometimes therapy will be hard in terms of the the painful part of it but it's just so that it won't be as hard as things are now so just because you're numbing out just because you're trying not to feel the feelings doesn't mean you aren't struggling mm. I, I like to say that numbness isn't nothingness numbness is not the absence of feelings it's it's a sense of being overwhelmed by too many feelings mm. and then what happens is when we're numb we kind of direct our those feelings because the feelings haven't gone away they're still there and we direct them into let's say behaviors so mm. the feelings are there but they come out as a short temperedness they come out as an inability to sit still they come out as too much wine or food or um you know or or just you know people who are like 
just on the internet all day long, clicking and clicking and clicking and clicking mm. like a like a lab rat, right? Um, a colleague of mine said that the internet was um, the most effective short-term non-prescription painkiller out there. <laughs> right. so, so that's a drug, you know, I mean, they turn to other drugs, right? All of these things are drugs. All of these ways yeah. of being are, are ways of managing something that feels unspeakable to them. And so even with like in the book where the first patient that you meet is John and he's this very abrasive, um, he's insulting to me, he's very unlikable. He's, he's this guy that people say, well, why would you even take him into treatment? And that's because I knew that his behavior, his way of sort of keeping people away with his obnoxiousness was a way for him. It was the only way that he felt safe doing something with his feelings. And it wasn't, it wasn't in his awareness. He didn't consciously say, I'm going to keep people away because I can't deal with this underlying pain. It was that he just could not bear to think about it, much less to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And yet, of course, it came out in all of these ways that affected his marriage, that affected his sleep, that affected, you know, his, his yeah. functioning. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I could, I could definitely relate, uh, you know, to, to John. I used to have insane anger issues. And I, I, I remember when I first got sober, my mom, she's been sober about 14 years now. And uh, yeah, I, I remember telling her when she first got me sober that, I drank and used drugs as part of my, like, that was my anger management tool, right? Yeah. Like, I did that, and then when I got off of them, that's when all my anger unleashed. And kind of like what you're talking about with just, you know, the internet and, you know, all these different things, and whether it's, you know, drugs or the internet or just binging TV shows, and just all these different ways we try to escape feelings. How, how do you work with people on just being with their feelings? Like, for me personally, it was, it was meditation right? And realizing that my feelings weren't going to kill me, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. that, was, that was such an empowering thing for me. Like, wow, I can just, I can just sit with this and not respond to it and just kind of notice it. Um, but yeah, do you have any tools or techniques for just being with what's going on? Right. Well, what you're saying is absolutely true, that our fear of our feelings is often scarier than the feelings themselves. Mm. So I think that's really important for people to consider. And I also, you know, it's interesting because I've noticed that when people come into my office, they are so afraid of talking to other people about how they feel. And so the book's title, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, doesn't necessarily mean you should talk to a therapist. Mm. Um, you know, the book isn't about people who go to therapy. It isn't for people who go to therapy necessarily. It's for anybody. Um, and because I think we need to be talking more to one another. So what I see is that often men will come in and they'll say something like, you know, I've never told anybody this before. Mm. And, and then I wait, you know, what is this going to be? And it's usually something so mild and I, I have <laughs> so much compassion for that because I'm thinking, wow, in our culture, it is so unacceptable for men to be vulnerable in any way that even this and even if this person has like a great partner or great friends or great family, they felt like I can't share this part of myself with anyone. Women will also come in and say, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother, my sister, and my best friend, right? So they, they've told maybe one to three people, but they feel like they haven't told anyone. They feel like there's so much shame behind whatever this thing is. And usually, by the way, the thing that they disclose at that point, usually... I can see maybe why they felt reluctant, um, you know, more so than maybe what, what some man might have told, right? Yeah. Um, and these are obviously generalizations. It's, you know, there are, there are okay. exceptions to these. But, um, but I've noticed that when, you know, you ask, well, how do you get people to feel their feelings? And I think that's why I wrote this book was I wanted to show people what this process looks like. Mm. That I think people have this idea from the media about, you know, what a therapist is, which is <laughs> generally yeah. not what they're seeing on TV, which is, I, I think, you know, we're, we're doing a television series um, yeah. of the book. And it's really important to me that just like in the book that people see what is this process really like and how can we benefit from it? And even if you don't go to therapy, what can you take from it and apply to your own life? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's really just how, how to be a person in the world. Yeah. 
you know, how can we, how can we be a person in the world and feel okay about ourselves and feel okay with whatever we're feeling and then use our feelings. I think our feelings are like our superpower Mm -hmm. because they tell us what we want. So if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling angry, even envy, I don't know if I would classify that as a feeling, but (laughs) Um, I always say to people, follow your envy. It tells you what you want. So many people will look at other people and say, oh, I wish I had what that person has. Um, mm. their, their partner, their family, their money, their job, their house, their, you know, whatever, their good looks, you know, whatever it is. Um, and it's kind of like, this is an indication that you want something like that for yourself. What is the thing that you actually want? And what steps can you take right now, today, to get closer to that. And, and mm-hmm. same with anxiety, like, you know, follow your anxiety. It's telling you what's not working. Mm. That's really useful information. If you ignore your feelings, it's like you're working with a glitchy GPS and you're right. just going to sort of wander off in all these random directions and get nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, I love that you touched on that. I've, I've kind of learned to just be mindful of what I'm feeling and, and looking at them as like these little, these little like kind of alarm bells, like of which directions I, I need to be going. And if I don't know, I can sit and kind of break it down and say, why am I feeling this? Especially with envy, right? Like, yeah. why, like why do I care that that person's successful? Why is this bringing up things inside of me, you know? And I realized that, you know, happiness is this abundant resource. Like somebody else's happiness does not take away from mine. There's plenty of happiness to go around, you know? Right. Um, it's not like, it's not like a, like a pizza and there are, there mm. are a certain number of slices and only certain people get them and then you're out. It's more like love. Yeah. It's, it, it expands, it's expansive. And so I think that goodwill is expansive and generosity is expansive. And so just because somebody else has something that you want doesn't mean that, you, that they're taking that away from you. In fact, they are probably motivating you. So you should mm. thank them for their success Absolutely. because, because what it does is it says, Oh, wow, I'm seeing possibility for myself that I never saw before. Absolutely. Well, I know you got to get going and I wanted to thank you again, Lori, for your time. And real quick, can you let the audience know where they can, where they can find you, keep track with all your awesome projects, like the TV show, podcast, all that stuff. What's sure. the best way to get, see what you're up to? Yeah. So um, they can get information about me on my website, which is lauriegottlieb.com. They can watch my TED talk, which is about how changing our stories can change our lives. Um, it was one of the top 10 most watched podcasts at uh, uh, TED Talks last year. Um, they can um, read my book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which yeah. is available at bookstores everywhere. And even during this time, um, bookstores are delivering. Please support your independent bookstores. Um, they can uh, what, they can listen to my new, um, my new Dear Therapist podcast, which comes out in two weeks. They can read my weekly Dear Therapist column in The Atlantic. Um, they can follow me on Twitter at Lori Gottlieb one on Instagram at Lori Gottlieb underscore author. I'm also on Facebook. Um, so, uh, however they want to connect with me, I would love to be, uh, in touch with them. Awesome. Yeah. You're, you're everywhere. So all this stuff will be provided in the description below and thank you again, Lori, for your time. And I'll talk to you soon. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. So once again, huge, huge thank you to Lori for coming on to the podcast and make sure you check out the description down below. I will have links to everything that Lori's got going on. I'll have a link to her book, all that kind of stuff. Make sure you're following her on Twitter. She is very active on Twitter. She tweets out like all of her new projects and podcasts and her articles are going out and everything like that. So make sure that you check out the description down below. Make sure you go follow her on social media. All right. But anyways, that's all I got for this video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. And a huge, huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel over on Patreon, as well as everybody who supports the channel by buying my mental health books at TheRewiredSoul.com and everyone who gets merch from the merch store. All right, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.